Okay, the, the hour has arrived. Hello everyone, welcome to Lying to the Neighbors, Nasty Effects with Trackerless BitTorrent by Astro. Please give them a round of applause. Good morning everyone. Yeah, I call myself Astro and I'm really keen on experimenting with network protocols and coding with them. And BitTorrent is really great. I make a lot of use of it. And one day I started reading on trackless BitTorrent and there was one issue that caught my eye. And then I started experimenting just as proof of concept. Um, it looks like some of the information is already known to the BitTorrent developers, but information is rather scattered. Um, they normally uh, communicate over IRC, and there's a web forum on bitterrand.org where you can find some vague information on this. But I think this problem deserves more attention. And it's also an advice to anyone um, experimenting with uh, distributed hash tables, uh, especially with uh, .p2p DNS on the horizon like recently. Um, yes, recently we've had uh, the uh, Anon Ops attacks, and I think uh, DDoS, it's about denying information, so this is a form of censorship, and with great power comes great responsibility. Um, Please do not do this in the event network here. We really value uh, the liberal network policy, and it would be a really pity if uh, the NOC had to introduce any filters before the packets hit the Wi-Fi. And also, please think of the kittens. <laughs> So I want to approach the topic by explaining uh, why we need trackless BitTorrent and how BitTorrent works conventionally. Um, you need to fetch a torrent first, a torrent file. It describes the data that is being exchanged between the peers. The peers are called the swarm. And once a client has the uh, torrent file, it needs to do tracker requests. Trackers hold the uh, peer addresses per torrent file. Um, it's quite obvious that there are two single points of failure. Um, the torrent indexes on the web and the trackers. Um, the impact of a tracker failure is alleviated by um, an extension called torrent, uh, uh, called announce list, where you can put multiple trackers into a torrent file, but it's still central service. So one uh, recurrent topic is uh, B encoding or binary encoding, which is used for uh, the BitTorrent extension protocol for DHT packets and, of course, for torrent files themselves. This is how a torrent file looks like. Uh, the data format has four types, integers, length, prefix, uh, strings, lists, and dictionaries, and that's all. Uh, it's kind of like JSON, but it's binary safe. So in a torrent file, we usually find this uh, structure. This is a screenshot of a gtorrent viewer, which is a nice graphical program to inspect torrent files. Um, the significant part is the info hash. We, the whole torrent file is a dictionary. It has one specific key info. and. This is being hashed. Uh, 
the binary encode value. And this is the so-called info hash. This uh, complicates torrent parsers quite a bit. But the really nice thing here is uh, we can modify the uh, metadata, like the tracker address, or we can put some initial DHT nodes in there. And still, the info hash stays the same, so the torrent isn't modified. <clears throat> um, yes, the content, the actual content is described by this uh, big pieces string, uh, which contains just uh, SHA1 sums of um, the individual pieces of the data that is being shared. <clears throat> so you can see BitTorrent is really only useful uh, for static data because um, if this uh, info, uh, if this piece hashes change, the whole info hash is changed. Um, so one single point of failure are the indexes, and we don't want central indexes that can be taken down like the Pirate Bay, which is still alive, but has been down already. Um, a much more convenient method is a link form, which you can just pass around textually. Uh, just remember the spread of the HD DVD key. It was like, what was it? Maybe 64 bytes, which can be represented in hexadecimal, like in this magnet link, and can therefore be spread easily. Uh, those magnet links have some parts. Um, the first uh, BTIH uh, specifies that it's uh, BitTorrent, then follows the info hash that uh, is the key for the data that is to be downloaded, then follows a directory name, and you can give it a tracker address, but not necessarily. Um, yes, what we still need is a description of the data in the torrent. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in these uh, torrent files, there uh, is a description what are the individual files, how big are they, what are their names. And if you use magnet links, you do tracker requests, you get peers, um, and then there's an extension where you can download the info value of the torrent file from another peer. And then you can finally start downloading. You only get the info value from other peers, but uh, there's another extension for exchanging tracker addresses. So the other single point of failure are trackers. There are two solutions. Peer exchange um, works in the swarm that is uh, individual for a torrent or info hash. And therefore, you need at least one peer because it's data exchanged via peer-to-peer. -peer. So to start off to download a torrent, you need, another, uh, you need other means to find peers and there is this uh, distributed hash table uh, extension, which is globally, so it's not per info hash. And there's on, I think there's only one DHT, or one big DHT worldwide. Um, yeah, and they use the Academia flavor. There are some other DHT algorithms like uh, court and pastry, but uh, this one is 
widespread. So, uh, what uh, questions do we ask? Uh, who stores data? Someone has to. Uh, preferably not central service. Um, so, everyone stores data. It's peer to peer. And how to interact with data that's related. Um, we don't want to store all uh, IP addresses of DHT nodes because that wouldn't scale. The uh, BitTorrent DHT is uh, about 5 million nodes, and the figure is from a year ago. But uh, not all are reachable. Uh, reachable are like 30,000 uh, that are not behind network address translations, translation or firewall. So you don't want to store all the addresses, and therefore you ask your way through the known nodes, the nodes that are known to you. Yeah, um, it's again 160 bit, 20 bytes, uh, which is exactly the info hash length. And the protocol is quite simple. It's uh, this previously explained B encoding just in UDP packets. Uh, four operations. And these operations have kind of like RPC semantics. Um, there are uh, clients that may care about timeouts and retrying. So, as a reminder, everywhere 160 bit, conveniently, torrent info hash, DHT node ID, and quite unrelated and not really relevant for this talk is the client peer ID, um, which could be used to, to collect uh, version statistics, which is pretty nice, or pretty useful. So we got this 160-bit space, and we need uh, to define how the node nearest to the info hash stores, or what node nearest to the info hash stores uh, the tracker data for the torrent, for the torrent file or info hash. Um, and therefore, we need to introduce a distance metric. This is, uh, and this is specific to Kedimlia, uh, XO, bitwise ex exclusive O. And the nice property is that it's uh, a reflective, reflexive uh, operation. Therefore, you don't need, uh, it's really convenient to use. <coughs> These, uh, this is a tad simplified, but in general it works like this. And all the node IDs that one node deals with are relative to the own node idea, ID. <coughs> and because uh, we do this over distance... I'm sorry. Could you please speak closer to the microphone? Isn't this the microphone? Oh, oh, it's that face. Oh, I get it. Don't you understand me? Um, I'm very sorry. Oh, should we use this one? They were saying there's some feedback. Mm -hmm. um, should we change anything? No? Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Okay, the important thing here with uh, this bucket routing is that um, the closer uh, one node, or the closer a node ID is uh, to another node ID, the less probable this is. Um, because all, uh, imagine this is the key space and all the DHT nodes are equally distributed over the key space. So I store one 
Uh, I store eight peers in bucket zero. Oh, yeah, one is actually bucket zero, and two is actually bucket one, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> And this uh, representation should um, clarify that it's uh, less probable to have a neighbor that is like in bucket eight or even a higher bucket. So there are lots of uh, DHT nodes that are uh, eligible to get into bucket zero, but there are many less to get into bucket eight because they are nearer to a client's own node ID. Um, don't let the word buckets uh, confuse you. Uh, it's just eight times the node ID, uh, IP address, and port. That's it. So, the two, uh, the interesting request, the interesting operation is find node for bootstrapping, finding your place in the DHT, uh, for knitting around holes, and of course to grow the DHT. Specifically to Kedimlia is that you not only um, you not only uh, actively look for other nodes, but of course you also need to accept incoming packets, uh, evaluate the node ID if it's really, uh, if it could be a new neighbor. And this uh, allows new nodes at all. Um, the request ID is for uh, request response uh, association for the RPC semantics. And the really interesting thing is that with each uh, find node packet, we get the sender's node ID. And this one is useful for a popularity contest. Um, we don't want to wait for our node ID to, uh, to become uh, more widespread known in the DHT. This could take a long time. We want to become popular quick. And because the uh, nearest node ID is least probable, we have good, uh, a high probability to become a valid neighbor to become known to as many nodes as possible to get into their routing buckets. The uh, find node request uh, responses also contain these node IDs, precious node IDs, where we can flip some of the least significant bits and become a neighboring node ID. And this is what the title Lines and Neighbors is about. So this is a test. Um, you can see the uh, four packet types. Um, and what the uh, test does is it regularly uh, Larry contacts uh, peers with their own uh, with their own node ID but with some of the less significant bits flipped and it seems to be an exponential growth I think from minute 15 on it's uh, CPU or IO bound <coughs> and exponential because uh, the other nodes will gossip among each other what are, um, what are suitable nodes in their key space neighborhood. 
Uh, find node requests is uh, 92 bytes. Responses, the, th uh, the packets that we sent, are 208 bytes. And this is really not a good ratio, but the exponential growth means uh, once started, it will develop itself and get big. Maybe the total packet rate is much higher than 14,000 packets. I didn't, well, computers have limits. <clears throat> um, how do we use that uh, popularity? Um, we ourselves get a uh, find note request, as you can see here, and of course we can respond with eight uh, note IDs and addresses and quotes. And this is a test where I uh, put eight UDP ports into those find note responses, and the impact is, in terms of the packet rate, quite higher than um, the traffic we have. So this is uh, traffic at the target. Um, yes, packets are again be unhooded requests to uh, arbitrary addresses. And on a network level, uh, what is critical are stateful firewalls, because uh, this is from random internet hosts, and uh, stateful firewalls may create one entry per packet and will quickly have their tables filled. Um, also, uh, network interface card drivers are quite prone to collapsing over high packet rates. On the application level, uh, this only affects poor parsers. Because my proposition is um, UDP parsers are much more efficient than TCP parsers because the uh, packet boundary is already known. Uh, also, TCP requires quite some state uh, keeping in the operating system. So, this one has been done before with trackers. Anyone who controls a popular tracker has incredible power to DDoS. Can we do the same here? So what we need is sock puppets. And these are uh, yeah, the cheap replicas of meaningful nodes, or as in the so-called Zibble attack, it's uh, forging identities in peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, Zibble is named after a woman with a multiple personality disorder. So remember, the node ID is random or arbitrary, and we, but we don't want to fetch like 500 torrent files. So the really nice thing at uh, a lot of BitTorrent indexes is uh, you can sort by CDs and leeches, and if you do that for normal the torrent usage, you will have high rates, high uh, download rates. And Pirate Bay, for instance, offers magnet links directly in the listing. So we can just scrape that, uh, scrape that information from the web page, and use node IDs, popular node IDs. Uh, this gets a much more controlled approach than the first attack. This, for example, is the uh, DHT traffic for a node that has, uh, that has communicated with other DHT nodes as the 267 most leached torrents on Pirate Bay. 
And what's interesting here is that we still have, uh, contrary to the previous attack, uh, a fairly low rate of find node requests, but uh, the get peers for the tracker data itself is accelerating much more. And what can we do with uh, get peers requests? We can respond with um, deterrent peer addresses, IP address and port. And the clients that queried me will uh, try to establish a connection there. Um, get peers requests are 95 bytes. Responses are 65 uh, plus six bytes per address we pass. So it's fairly low weight. Um, the impact looked like this. Es excuse my testing methodology. Um, I wanted to keep my Amazon EC2 bill low. This uh, graph has is traffic at the target, and each curve um, represents a port that was used one, two, or five, uh, four times in the get peers response. The packet rate isn't that impressive, but it's still hard to filter this. Uh, these connections coming from random IP addresses. And note the tail. Uh, there are many implementations, uh, some cache uh, addre peer addresses longer, some uh, have duplicate detection by port or by IP. Um, and I think the reason for this uh, decline after half an hour is that the tracker, uh, that the yeah, tracker request get notes um, interval is uh, 1,800 seconds. But clients may implement this differently. Um, so, what's the traffic that's resulting in this? A TCP connection with uh, the BitTorrent protocol handshake, which is 38 bytes. Or a bit bigger if uh, message stream encryption is enabled. So, the really critical part for the, uh, for the target is Whatever services are running there, they need efficient parsers, parsers that terminate early if they detect protocol violations for their actual service. Uh, one serious victim is SSL. And the general advice is either do your parsing on all ends right or use tools like uh, parser generators or combinators. So does this mean you should panic and turn off the DHT? I don't think so. Um, not all the nodes are sending all the time. For you as an individual DHT node, it won't matter if you send like one UDP packet each 10 seconds. Well, there are some clients which start to send a lot of packets. But uh, that should be fixed, of course. Um, the DHT is still usable. Um, trackers are not often. I ha have really uh, performance problems with uh, trackers. My BitTorrent client starts to hang with these HTTP requests, and DHT just works. So client implementers, as an advice, may start to index uh, their 
DHT routing information not only by distance but by IP address and it will get likely that you are able to detect uh, such malicious behavior and this is many duplicate IPs per many uh, one IP per many node uh, info hashes no, uh, the HT node IDs are clearly a sign for malicious activity uh, and are much more likely than uh, many clients behind network address sensation that is properly set up. And clients should not uh, communicate with privileged ports because there's, there are serious services behind that and now peer to peer. So, is there a way out? Uh, I discovered uh, another protocol that uses the Kademlia DHT. It's uh, Telehash by Jeremy Miller. Uh, the solution they approached, or he approached, is to not make the node ID random, but to make it a hash that is verifiable. And by using IP address and port, or maybe only the IP address, the uh, possible node IDs per IP uh, are reduced drastically. And it's much, much, much less likely that you uh, can hash one of your IP addresses or ports to uh, immediate neighbors or uh, popular info hashes. It seems, I recently uh, got notice that uh, this has been proposed for BitTorrent, notably not on BitTorrent.org. Um, the problem, uh, they uh, plan to have a transition period where they start to implement this hashing, uh, still accept um, random node IDs, so the system doesn't break down, but uh, <coughs> after some time, I don't know how long they have planned, uh, they will switch to verif verifying um, these hashes. The big problem is that uh, malicious people, uh, IPv6, malicious people can probably get big networks uh, with where they can have many possible node IDs while you still want to allow a client with a single IP address to participate in the DHD system. Okay, thanks for listening. Questions? <laughs>